bit about how populations change, and we've talked about distributions from pretty much the first of the year. Um, if we have a distribution for some trait in a population and it's not changing, it's not going anywhere, it's staying about the same generation to generation over you know, tens or hundreds or thousands of years, we say that that population is in equilibrium for that trait. And eye color in humans is one where for 90,000 years of human history, what color are her eyes was the stupidest question ever. They're brown, duh. What color are cow's eyes? Brown. What color are dog's eyes with one, two notable exceptions, three notable exceptions? What color are dog's eyes? Brown. What are the exceptions? Huskies, um, Australian shepherds, and Catahoula leopard hounds have mutations in their breed that create blue eyes. Oh, there are some light-eyed pit bulls. So, are dogs evolving to have more diversity of eye color? Quite possibly, yeah, through selective breeding. Oh, that's a good example. We'll use that later. Um, okay. 90,000 years, humans were at equilibrium for eye color. Suddenly, we get some new color option. We're not at equilibrium anymore. We've shaken up equilibrium. Now the population is going to evolve. So, whoops. Let me get rid of this one. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is just a way of describing. What are you typing on? It's not your iPad. Okay. End of the day, do you want Tuesday or Thursday? Boy, people are not making good use of the pocket hanger anymore, are they? Fascinating. Would you prefer Tuesday or Thursday of next week? I have to put the paperwork through. It takes a while to go through the office. So you will be notified when it's been scheduled. So populations stay at equilibrium if these conditions are met. There are no big mutations. We don't get some new option like blue eyes. Um, we don't have individuals entering or leaving the population. The population is big. We're going to do an exercise tomorrow with very small populations um, of things that you get to eat when you're done preying on them. If mating is random, this doesn't usually happen in humans. In most animal species, it doesn't happen. It happens more in plants and stuff. Um, random mating means there are no selection criteria whatsoever. No selection occurs. How often does this actually happen that a population is not evolving at all? Not all that often. Usually there are some changes happening in the population. So really what we're asking about when populations start to evolve is what shakes up this equilibrium? What kickstarts a population to evolve out of not really evolving, not changing? And you may have gone through periods in your life where like nothing's changing, everything's just the same, and something comes in to shake it up, and suddenly something changes. Maybe for the good, maybe for the bad, but now things are changing. Well, what we're looking at is what shakes up equilibrium. What's the boot in the butt that makes a population start to change, that causes evolution to happen? Mutations, migration, Genetic drift, which is what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Selective mating, which most animal species do, one way or another. And natural selection. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, too. Mutations, migration, genetic drift, selective mating, and natural selection. <clears throat> Mutations! Change distribution just by introducing an option. Change the distribution of traits by introducing new options. That's what that article was about. So that article was about a new option that cropped up in humans about 10,000 years ago, somewhere around the Caucasus Mountains. That's near like Russia and Tajikistan, sort of the Black Sea region, um, be like southeastern Europe. So how many of you have ever held a baby? Any baby? cousin, niece, nephew, neighbor, random kid.
kid on the street that somebody handed to you. Here, hold this. Okay. You, you probably haven't held a lot of brand new newborns. Um, they all start out with light eyes. No matter how dark your eyes are as an adult, um, newborns tend to start out with sort of dark blue eyes. They're, they're not, the pigment hasn't filled in yet. It's like they're not all the way colored in. And then they change and they darken over the first month or so until they're their permanent color. And they, can, they shift a little bit up to two or three usually. It's rare for them to change eyes, change color after that. And no, your eyes do not change day to day. No, it is okay. Okay, I was gonna say because I, ha I always have people go, "Well, my eyes are different colors." No, they're not. No, my eyes are blue dots about ten. Okay, and that's unusual to have a change that late. Um, and if they went from blue to something like a hazel or a green, you're producing more melanin, yeah, which is covering the blue. Green and they have a blue So, prior to ten thousand years ago, like I said. What color are his eyes was the stupidest question you could ask. They're brown. All eyes are brown. And then 10,000 years ago, one individual, one individual had eyes that didn't change. And people probably paid a quarter or like a mammoth hide or whatever the going currency was. No, really, seriously, dude, I know. I just can't stop staring at them. They're so weird. They're blue. Yours aren't even blue. I'm staring at the wrong. You're not a blue-eyed mutant. Here. No, seriously. Have you seen her eyes? They're not brown. It's weird. People came from far and wide to stare at her eyes. Ah! Because it was this new thing. It was something that had not been seen before. It was a brand new trait. There was no variation in eye color in humans prior to 10,000 years ago. We all had brown eyes. 90,000 years of human history, brown eyes, brown eyes, brown eyes, brown eyes. And then there's that one freaky person whose eyes never turn dark. <coughs> now, that one freaky person could have been killed by a falling boulder in childhood. Could have died of infectious disease in childhood. Lots did. Could have died at birth. Could have been left out for the wolves because they were so freaky looking and they thought it was a curse of some sort. Anything could have happened. But there's really good evidence sitting in this room that it didn't. That trait persisted in the population. That trait didn't even exist prior to that one freaky individual. There were no blue eyes in humans. Now, we're coming at it from, admittedly, a perspective. We all tend to think that whatever is our experience is normal. And looking around this room and being from Columbiana County, Ohio, being from rural Columbiana County, Ohio, um, I can bet you even odds that looking at this room, I would say all of you have a lot of ancestry in Europe. Now, could you have African genes, Asian genes, Native American genes? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Australian Aboriginal genes? Yeah, you could. It's quite possible. One of the neat things about this country is that we are this big melting pot. We've taken genes from all over the planet, and we've thrown them in and stirred really well. That's cool. It leads to some hybrid vigor. That's a good thing. These light-eyed traits spread. I, I thought that article was cool because I had never seen an explanation of why it became more common, a good explanation. And I thought that article did a really good job of relating how humans were living at the time with how that gene would have spread. Basically, it worked down to blue eyes were sexy because they were weird. And, you know, I just want to keep staring at those eyes. And somebody did. And they did more than stare. So there were blue-eyed babies. Those blue-eyed genes persist. That's how it works. If you missed that part of health, you should go back to health. We don't go into a whole lot of depth here. I assume you understand how that works. Mutations introduce new options. Who here has a dog? What color is your dog, Sage? Or no, fur, fur. fur. Brown. brown, brown furred dog. What color is your dog, Maddie? Black and red. What color is your dog, Matt? White, okay. What color is your dog, Daniel? Black and white, and then it's not like brown. Okay, black and white and brown. Um, I have a yellow lab. 
big old, she's a mutt, but she's probably mostly yellow lab. You have yellow dog. Okay, lab golden retriever. Um, we have variation in fur color. Anybody ever seen a bright red wolf? Like an Irish setter red kind of wolf? That'd be cool. You have? Where? Okay. Now they're, they're <laughs> say, whoa, <laughs> where are you hanging out? Um, set up some trail cams wherever it is. We have a lot of variation in fur color in dogs. At one point in canine evolution, there were no options for fur color. There was some default color. Mutations provide new options. Immigration. So immigration and you know this from social studies. Immigration is individuals coming into a population. Emigration is individuals exiting a population. So in social studies, you do a lot, I think, with immigration to this country. We don't do a whole lot with emigration, but it's just the opposite, and you already know that. What is it? It's wolves. Yeah. Um, and these are actually some of the wolves from Yellowstone. Yellowstone is a huge national park in Wyoming. It's out west. Has anybody ever been to Yellowstone? You have? Did you camp there? Did you hike there? You just drove through? Okay, darn it. I would really like to go. I'm not sure I'm up for backpacking in Yellowstone what with the grizzlies and all, but I'd like to do some hiking <laughs> in large groups. No group of 10 or more has ever been attacked by a grizzly. Fun fact. Um, so I'd like to go with 11 people. Uh, just in case. <laughs> Lots of bells on. So these are some pictures of wolves from Yellowstone. And... Growing up, seeing pictures of wolves and just thinking about wolves, because kids think about wolves, I did. Wolves are what? Like grayish brown, just kind of generically sort of light colored, right? Never in my childhood imaginings was there a wolf that looked like that. That's a wolf. That is a wolf. Oh, no, no, no. These are wolves. These are wolves. These are, these are you know, timber wolves in Yellowstone. And that's a black wolf. kind of weird. Well, wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone, I think, 15 years ago. It might have been as long as 20. I may have lost track. And they were wolves from upper peninsula of, or upper Minnesota, northern Minnesota and Canada, I believe. Timber wolves from that population were introduced to Yellowstone. And at some point, a genetic variant popped up, and some of them came out with totally black coats. pretty tough looking. They are, aren't they? Like Black Wolf. It's like somebody's, I don't know what kind of name. It's their stupid pretend tough nickname. Hi, I'm Black Wolf. Sure you are. Um, so at some point we had a few, indi one individual probably with a black coat. And later in the year when we do ecology, we may or may not get a chance to watch a film about the wolves of Yellowstone but you will see quite a few black wolves. What does that mean? It means he did well for himself. And it was probably a he. Uh, it could have been, well, it could have been a female also. Um, but if this individual migrated into an area, female wolves do not tend to migrate. They tend to stay in their home ranges. Young males tend to be the ones who have to go off and find a new, a new pack to call home or found their own pack. So if this individual, who might have been the result of a mutation to start with and introduced a new trait, migrated into a pack that was formerly these colors, and he does well for himself, then we're liable to see more black wolves in the future because he brought new genes with him. Now, this is some wild horses from the Rockies. And there was a PBS series done on the wild horses, and it was something like the Ballad of Sky dancer. It was this very distinctively colored stallion, this blonde stallion. And wild horses come in a variety of colors, but this guy was really distinctive. He showed up, I mean, like you could be in a helicopter and pick him out of the herd because he was really distinctive <coughs> blonde. 
in the Rockies with wild horses, they do a lot of weird stuff where they round them up and sell them off and drive them out of particular valleys and all this stuff. He was removed from the herd that he had been running with. And where you had been seeing little blonde horses pop up periodically, the one roundup, they're easy to pick out from a helicopter, easy to see at a distance, and cool looking. So people want to buy them at auction. These genes were removed from the population. Suddenly, no more little blonde wild horses up in those valleys. That's emigration. So what does emigration do? It takes genes and moves them around. When individuals enter a population, they bring new genes into the gene pool. The gene pool is all the genes that you exist. And when they leave, they take their genes and go home. I'm taking my genes and I'm going home. One of these increases genetic diversity in a population. One actually decreases it. The thing that I liked about that article was that I had not seen a good discussion of how those blue-eyed genes would have spread, why they would have spread, why those babies just didn't get left out for the wolves because they were cursed with these weird eyes. So, okay, through a whole variety of types of selection, we end up with a lot of lighter-eyed variety of eye colors in Europe. Africa, China, Australia, North America, South America, all still dark-eyed universally. There is no variation. So you get European contact in North America. Um, first European contact was probably the Vikings, like what, 1,500 years ago, something like that. There were Viking settlements in Canada. Um, don't let the Spaniards get all the credit. The Vikings did it first. Um, there, were, there were pretty well-documented settlements on the Canadian coast, the Atlantic coast of Canada. So you start to have immigration from Europe to North America. The minute that the people who are immigrating from, North, from Europe to North America start interbreeding with people who are already living in North America, what are you doing? You're increasing the diversity of genes available. You have African Americans who are brought here not voluntarily, who have involuntary migration to North America. That increases the diversity of genes in North America. So North America really is interesting in, in terms of global mixing of genes. When an individual enters an area, they bring their genes with them. If you have a very small gene pool, immigration can really profoundly affect the genes that are available. If you have a bigger gene pool, it doesn't matter as much. So let me ask you this question. I mean, we only have a few minutes, I know. How many of you have at least one parent who is a graduate of either Beaver Local or East Liverpool? Okay. How many of you have at least one parent who is a graduate of Beaver Local, East Liverpool, Lisbon, or East Palestine? Okay. If, uh, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. If we add Columbiana, Crestview, Letonia, Washingtonville, and Salem to the list, anybody, any new hands go up? Okay. If we say all Columbiana County schools, at least one parent who grew up and went to high school in Columbiana County anywhere. Me too. Okay. So here's the interesting thing about Ohio and about rural areas in general. We tend to not be terribly mobile. How many of you have a grandparent who's a graduate of Beaver Local or East Liverpool? Okay. And keep them up. What if we extend that to any school in Columbiana County? Great. Grandparents now. Okay. Here's the interesting thing. We tend to not move around very, we tend to not move very far. Um, rural areas tend to have less migration than urban areas. Not a lot of people move to Columbiana County, Ohio from the big city to get a good job. But plenty of people from Columbiana County, Ohio move to a larger city, to Cleveland, to Pittsburgh, to New York, to Buffalo, to Chicago, usually for economic reasons. Um, we tend to have more stable gene pools. They don't change as much. We don't get as much immigration. Uh, 
what happens if there's no immigration and everybody is just interbreeding? Does the diversity in the gene pool increase? No. You actually get to the point where you're inbreeding. My, so my, my dad did a lot of genealogy work on our family, and his family's all from Switzerland. And they're from these little tiny farming villages way up in the mountains. Like, think about a town the size of New Waterford, except it's like an hour from every other town by windy, narrow, mountainside, scary, like, poop-your-pants kind of curves and cliffs road. Terrifying. Terrifying. And what my dad found in doing the genealogy work is, so, I mean, these are like towns the size of New Waterford. If generation after generation after generation, everybody marries somebody from town, what happens? You are all related, sweetheart. You are all marrying your cousins. You want to date anybody around here? Great, you're dating a cousin. Because it's a small gene pool. Now, what my dad noticed was that when he did the genealogical research, usually at least several, and he was tracing males because it's, you know, sorry, ladies, it is completely sexist the way we do genealogy because males carry the last name, so he tended to be looking at male descendants. Um, males tended to pick brides from other villages. What does that do? It, it, it enlarges the gene pool. It brings in some new genes. So you may be cousins on your dad's side, but at least mom's from the other mountain over. Seriously. You're broadening the gene pool. You're adding new genes. Tomorrow, what we're going to start to talk about is genetic drift. Um, I would love to go over the quiz. I don't think we have time. I would remind you to take the words that we've talked about in class today on your vocab. Start doing your part C's. We talked a lot about gene pool. Do you feel like you understand what that means?